There was a female disciple who was famous for her fierceness, fearlessness and renunciation of tradition. Our hero is a young woman named Thelka and the most important source for her life story is in a banned book called The Acts of Paul and Thelka. Several church fathers condemned it as heretical, though heretical doesn't necessarily mean made up, but we'll get into that in another video. Despite this, she is recognised as a saint in many traditions, suggesting at least the possibility that some of her story is rooted in truth. Let's get into it. I am Shauna the Artist and I condense large and complicated topics into short and engaging videos so that you can learn something new in a matter of minutes. Make sure you subscribe now so that we can spread this information and have some deep conversations together. Felka was a beautiful young maiden from a wealthy family in Iconium, Turkey. Her family wanted her to marry her social equal, a man named Thamaris. This plan was disrupted when the Apostle Paul came to the city to preach the word of Jesus Christ. Felka was sitting by her window and Paul started preaching in the town square outside. Felka was enchanted by his words and she sat down by the window for three days straight listening to him sing the praises of celibacy. He says, Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are they that keep the flesh chaste, for they shall become the temple of God. Blessed are they that abstain, for unto them God shall speak. Blessed are they that have renounced the world, for they shall be well pleasing unto God. Blessed are they that possess their wives as they have had them not, for they shall inherit God. The emphasis on virginity and total denial of the flesh makes the Acts of Paul and Thelka a Gnostic writing. More on Gnosticism and celibacy later. Thelka was instantly mesmerised and took his preachings on abstinence seriously. She shunned her fiancé and the opportunity for marriage and children, along with the other plans that her family had made for her future. Her mother, Theoclea, was furious. She accused her own daughter of being an anome and an anymph, and Paul as being a xenos and a magos, and she ordered the authorities to arrest Paul. He was thrown into prison, and her mother assumed that that would be the end of it. But Selka had other plans. She bribed her way into the prison, where she continued to listen to his teachings. When Selka's mother learned that her attempt to keep them apart failed, she ordered to have her burnt at the stake. They lit the fire, and Selka does the sign of the cross, and against all odds, a torrential downpour occurs and puts out the fire. Selka is saved by an act of God. She decides to cut her hair short and wear male attire and journey with Paul around the Mediterranean to try and preach alongside him. Paul unenthusiastically agrees. They reach a city called Antioch. During their travels, an upper-class individual named Alexander found Thelka attractive and attempted to force himself on her. Paul did nothing to attempt to stop this and he even pretended not to know her. Thelka fights him off, but because he's a very high-class nobleman, Thelka gets into trouble for protecting herself. This time she is sentenced to be thrown to the beasts. She enters the arena alongside a lioness, a bear and a male lion. The lioness promptly lays down at her feet. The bear tries to attack, but the lioness rips it to shreds. The women in the crowd go crazy. They see her power and furiously protest to try and protect Selka. The lion then tries to attack her, but the lioness fiercely protects her and kills the lion. The lioness perishes along with it. She has the full support of every female in the crowd and a very wealthy woman, Thryphena, takes Selka on as her own. Having thus cheated death twice, she asks Paul to baptise her, but Paul refuses and says that it's too early. So she decides to baptise herself. She jumps into a pit of water filled with man-eating seals. She says, 
In the name of Christ, I baptise myself. She is instantly surrounded by a ring of fire and all of the seals perish. Again, the authorities try to tie her up between two balls and rip her apart. But again, the fire surrounds her and burns the rope. Out of fear, they finally release Thelka. Thelka returns home to Iconium and she tries to convert her mother to Christianity. But upon failing to do that, she retired to a proto-monastic life of prayer and solitude in the caves outside of Seleucia. Let's look at the acts of Paul and Thelka in context. Thelka's decision to shun marriage was very serious for the cultural norms of her times. In reality, not only did she rebel against the wishes and expectations of her family, she also ignored Roman tradition. Roman law punished women who were childless and single, especially if they were upper class. Choosing lifelong celibacy was virtually unthinkable. This also conflicts with the Bible's principles concerning marriage and sex. Husbands and wives are not to leave each other or to deprive one another of sex. And there is a huge emphasis on marriage and children. Today in the West, lifelong celibacy is generally thought of as a conservative choice. But in the late Roman times, when the norm was marriage and procreation, lifelong celibacy offered independence from Rome's patriarchal culture and the freedom to manage one's body and sexuality. Many apocryphal gospels promoted an impossible code concerning sexuality, rejecting sexual relations of any kind, not only outside of marriage, but also within. This is because the Gnostics believed that the earth was really hell and that procreation meant trapping more souls into the system. In early Christian circles, it was disputed if women should preach the word of God. Selka was contemplating preaching the word of God with Paul and he encouraged her to do so at one point. This is contrary to two canonical gospels. Let a woman learn quietly with all submissiveness. I do not permit a woman to teach or to exercise authority over a man. Rather, she is to remain quiet. For Adam was formed first, then Eve. And Adam was not deceived, but the woman was deceived and became a transgressor. Yet she will be saved through childbearing if they continue in faith and love and holiness with self-control. And women should remain silent in the churches. They are not allowed to speak, but must be in submission as the law says. If they want to inquire about something, they should ask their own husbands at home, for it is disgraceful for a woman to speak in the church. It is undeniable that certain women played a prominent role in earlier church communities and served as evangelists, preachers, teachers and pastors, as well as providing financial support and acting as patreons. But by the end of the first century, they were met with serious opposition from the Roman Empire. This opposition succeeded in forcing Christian women into submission to male authority and obscured the records of their earlier involvement. One of the few surviving examples we have is Jesus' relationship with women. Jesus is associated with women, which makes sense because he was interested in the suffering of those who are underprivileged. In the secret Gospel of Philip, he mentions how intimate Jesus was with Mary Magdalene and how he even used to kiss her somewhere. It was assumed on the mouth. Even if the missing word wasn't mouth, we ought to keep in mind that in antiquity, a kiss on the mouth did not always or necessarily imply sexual intimacy. It was also symbolic for transferring secret knowledge and spiritual power, especially in mystical or philosophical circles between a master and a disciple. The Acts of Paul and Thelka is also significant for it preserves an early surviving case of cross-dressing. At the time, it was held that males were closer to wisdom than females. Male attire enabled females to overcome the setbacks society possessed to them and establish their authority more easily. 
it is claimed that male attire allowed Thelka to obey 1 Corinthians and 1 Timothy, according to which only men could preach the word of God. The Acts of Paul and Thelka do not show that early Christian women were free from male domination, but rather that certain early Christian communities at least offered a choice and some hope. As far as I'm concerned, the Acts of Paul and Thelka is one of the first manuals for female empowerment. An unusual amount of attention was paid to the women in the story, and they are all mostly painted in a positive light. All the women around Thelka support her and encourage her. From Thrypena to the female citizens of Antioch and even the good animals inside the arena. Women throughout the text are very prominent, something that we certainly do not normally encounter in ancient literary works or in the canon. At the same time, all the male characters in the acts of Paul and Thelka are either outwardly mean or in the end proved to be inefficient. The fiancé, Thamaris, the Roman officials, the male beasts in the arena, and even the Apostle Paul, who seems to gradually, as a prop progresses, become more disappointing and weak, and he has a hard time of keeping up with Thelka. I certainly see this text appealing to a female audience, but that's just what I think. As usual, I'm more interested in what you all have to say. Tell me what your thoughts and opinions are in the comments section and we will chat. If you're still watching, thank you so much. I really appreciate it. Like and subscribe now so that we can reach more people and continue having these great conversations. Thank you, my friends, and I will see you in the next one.